Hi, I'm Joe Taranto and I'm joined by Mina Gooley, the CEO and founder of Thirst. And we're talking about the issue of global water scarcity today. Mina, thank you for joining me. Pleasure, Joe. Now, Mina, you've had a pretty uh, successful career to date. Yeah. Why thirst? Why, why now are you working in this space? I think the question actually is why water? Um, when I started my career, I was very much focused on climate change. And at the time, I didn't realise that if you think about climate change as a shark, water is the teeth. It's the place that we're going to be bitten first. And the more I found out about water, the more I realised that actually water is integral to everything, not just to the environment, but to our economies and our societies. And without enough water, without water being available to all of us, we have nothing to leave the next generation. And so I decided I wanted to do something about it. And do something you have. <laughs> Your um, campaign called Running Dry was something that most people would never contemplate in a lifetime. Um, not one, but you ambitiously <laughs> attempted a hundred marathons yeah. in a hundred days. Probably should have thought about that a bit better before I started. <laughs> Tell me about this. This is unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I had done two expeditions previously and I'd come back and told stories about the water crisis and people across the world listened. And that was amazing. I got this great platform to have a conversation, but it didn't drive enough action. And I thought, I've got to show people what it means to be 100% committed to driving change, not just change in a small sense, but change in a big sense. I need to show what it means to pick an issue so big you can't possibly believe that you can even get your head around it and stand up and say, I'm going to do this one step at a time. I'm going to make this happen. And so I thought, well, what better way to do it than to do something like running <laughs> 100 marathons in 100 days. I mean, when I say that now, it just seems completely ridiculous because I'm actually not a runner. I don't like it. Um, it's not the thing that I kind of do. I'm not naturally talented. It's just uh, like running is a struggle. But actually, for me, in so many ways, it's a metaphor of the struggle that we have to come up against every day to try to solve this water crisis. And just because something is hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Just because it's never been done before doesn't mean it can't be done. And just because people tell you it can't be done doesn't mean it actually can't be done. So uh, for me, this whole project is about demonstrating the art of what is possible when you believe in it with your heart, with your body, with your spirit and with your mind. And you've certainly had some support uh, globally from not just, yeah. uh, you know, other crazy people who want to run as well. <laughs> what, so. are you what are you saying? I'm crazy. <laughs> For, for me, it's it's a pretty crazy, crazy it's idea. Okay. But it's crazy for me it's, too. It's it's pretty wonderful to see that people jumping on board with the the running dry campaign, and um, obviously, uh, you know, you weren't able to finish the hundred, yeah. but you got pretty close. And but you really saw a community rally around you and 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 help you finish. Yeah, on day sixty two, when um, I was diagnosed with a broken leg my whole world collapsed around me. Not because I was in pain, not because I thought, wow, I can't do what I set out to do, all of those things too. But the main reason was because I really felt like I'd let down the people whose stories I hadn't yet told, the people who had gifted me their stories to tell in the previous 62 runs. And most importantly, because I felt that I'd let down water, that this precious thing that had driven me every single day for 62 days had now had not done my part of my commitment to it. And in that dark moment when I literally could not see light, some amazing things started to happen, which is that my team offered to step up and do day 63's marathon. And then people we didn't know joined on day 64. And then day 65, people in other parts of the world and slowly, actually pretty quickly, <laughs> it just kind of blossomed. And by the end of day 100, we hadn't just run one marathon, we'd run the like, hundreds of marathons, the equivalent from the North to the South Pole and more. It's, you know, it's so humbling and I feel so honored and inspired by all these people who stepped up and said, we care about water too, and we're prepared to do whatever it takes to make the world come along with us in this journey to raise awareness about this this problem. And I think for me, I'm really sad that I broke my leg. 
but I feel that we have received the most incredible gift from the global community and ultimately it's the community that's going to change the world, not me. No, one person can't change the world. No, I say it's people united by purpose, passion and perseverance and that's what this running dry community is. You know, I may have been the drop in the ocean, but they've, the waves of change have come from the community. It's amazing to see. It's, I'm amazed there's so many people who are ready to just jump and do a marathon at a minute's notice. So that, that's, that's inspiring. Well, what, no, no, actually, it's, this is really important because this is not about the running. This is actually about the stories. And this is not about the running, it's about the people. And we've always said, the point about the marathon is it's the closest run distance to the number 40. And by 2030, there's going to be a 40% greater demand for water than the supply of water available. So the marathon distance and this number 40 are synonymous to, to me, to us. And so what we always said to the people that participate is you don't have to run a marathon. Just get a group of people together and run the equivalent distance of a marathon. Because that the whole point is this symbolic nature of what we're doing. And an even bigger point is drawing people together as a community. And what actually happened when we asked people to run is that very few of them actually ran a full marathon each person. So we had thousands of people donating much smaller amounts of distance, getting together in groups, having coffee, going for a run, taking a walk with the dog, or doing whatever it took to, to cover the distance and to donate the miles to the campaign. And that, that's the brilliancy of this because you don't have to be anyone to be someone. You don't have to be anyone special to participate in a movement like this. You just have to be you. And so tell me, uh, we've talked a little bit about the crisis and the fact that, that supply um, you know, will not meet demand. And yeah. we know that it's one of the UN sustainability goals, yeah. um, the sustainable development goals. Um, so, so what was it uh, that, that brought you to you know, choose this one. There's the 17 goals. Why, why this particular one about clean water and ensuring that we have water for future generations? Oh, it's easy, because no matter what of the other goals you look at, without water, there's no life. So we need to solve the water crisis. Right now, 40% of the world's population lives in conditions of water scarcity at least one month a year. That's terrible. And these are things that are avoidable. These are, there are changes that we can make, technologies we can implement, behavioral systems we can encourage. There are so many things that we can do to avoid this issue. We just need to stand up and actually make it happen. We need to prioritize it. And the reality is that water is linked to all of the other SDGs in one way or another. Water is linked to food. Water is linked to um, women and gender issues. Water is linked to life above oceans and life below oceans. Water is linked to every other piece of the SDGs. So once we can solve this water crisis, this water problem, we can start to then see ripple effects throughout all of the other SDGs. So why water? Why SDG 6? Because it's fundamental to us, to everything we are, and everything we're going to leave behind for the next generation. So you've talked about change. You've yeah. talked about what you'd like to see happen. What can we do in Australia right now as individuals or organisations or communities, what would you like to see us do? What's really interesting about Australia is that in many ways we've been forced to confront issues about water scarcity, sanitation, hygiene, that other countries are now grappling with. What we have historically been less good at is shouting from the rooftops how great we are. What we've been less good at is explaining to others that we have an incredible body of knowledge, experience, technology, skills, things that we could easily export. And by exporting, we could build our Australian businesses, we can build partnerships internally and also offshore, and we can also make the world a better place. And if we can do all of those things, that's actually great for Australia, and it's great for, for us and for the next generation of, of water leaders that are coming along behind us who can then start to move into a sector that is, that is growing. So what do I want to see from Australia? I want to see more of us taking more of a leadership role, not only on the Australian political landscape, because I think that it's time for us to stand up and say water should be at the top of the agenda, not at the bottom. I think it's time for us to say water needs to be number one, not number 10. 
I want to see more of Australians in a world stage. I'm shocked at how little I see of Australian technology in the places I go run. I see Israeli technology everywhere and people always tell me they're the leaders, they're the leaders, they're the leaders and I think well actually in many ways we're the leaders too. In Egypt I was asked by government officials what can we do to make sure that we have a continued supply of water coming down the Nile once Ethiopia builds its hydroelectric dam. And I said, have you talked to the guys in Australia about how they manage the Murray-Darling Basin? And they said, no, we had no idea. You know, just these small things that could make a huge difference to the growth of this sector in Australia and also the growth of GDP and revenue into this country. So I guess that's a long-winded way of saying, I think that we have an opportunity to be leaders. And I'd like to see that happen. We have an opportunity to work together better than we have before. I think there's been a lot of different parties working in isolation and it's time for us to unite together to raise awareness about this issue and to demonstrate to Australian, Australians and to the world the power that we have as a community to solve some of the world's global water problems. Mina, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure.